I'm Eric Selder, President of the Red Bank Humanists. Thank you for coming today. I hope that you enjoy today's program and continue to join us in the future to share ideas and camaraderie with like-minded people. Humanism is a cosmopolitan philosophy that emphasizes values that are common to all people and downplays traditions and allegiances that divide us. Religion is just one of these dividers. Any ideology that elevates one portion of our species oppresses the rest. This recognition of our common humanity leads us to oppose bias in all of its forms. However, there's one form of bias that has affected the largest number of people over the longest period of human history. I'm speaking of the subjugation of women. This subjugation has many forms and has been challenged by many feminist heroes. But one in particular, Alice Paul, was born right here in New Jersey and died here as well. She focused her attention on political rights to vote and to serve in government as the clearest route to equality with men in all other spheres of life. Today we'll hear about Alice Paul and her contribution to our modern world. So today's speaker is Chris Myers. She is the director of programs at the Alice Paul Institute. There she manages heritage and leadership programs, including tours, presentations, and special events. She gives presentations like this on Alice Paul at locations throughout the state and manages the New Jersey Women's History website. I'd like you to join us all, join me in uh, a warm welcome for Chris Myers. Well, thank you. Um, we're celebrating today. It's uh, Women's History Month, and today is International Women's Day as well. Yay! <laughs> So she never understood what the deal was with, you know, why why don't we have an Equal Rights Amendment? Uh, you know, why did it take women over a uh, hundred years to to fight for the right to vote? Uh, simply, um, so so I think things are changing dramatically, but we've still got a long way to go. And I hope you you do challenge me with some questions because I've been studying Alice Paul now. Oh goodness, for about 15 years, and um, I am still learning about her. I still do research, and I'm discovering a lot about her life, uh, particularly after 1920, when she did uh, help women get the right to vote. She did so much more on an international level, and I'm told that in Europe she's better known, uh, particularly around uh, Switzerland where she had a headquarters, um, than she is here in the United States. Uh, but we're changing that. There's a, a couple of efforts that I'll tell you about uh, later on in the presentation. But let me tell you about my, my shiro, Alice Paul, and uh, why I think that she is uh, worth celebrating today and uh, every day. Um, she is from New Jersey, and you can see she was born in 1885 and had a nice long life, and in her 92 years, she is constantly fighting for this concept of ordinary equality. So these are actual photographs from her collection. Um, most of them are from her photograph albums or from the Library of Congress. So this is Paulsdale, and I do hope that you have a chance to come and visit. Uh, I talked with Trudy about uh, maybe arranging a trip later this year, because we are installing a new exhibit in September, so it'd be a good time to visit. Um, we're right in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, and the Alice Paul Institute is based at her historic home. Um, so here at Paulsdale, this is what it looks like today, we did preserve it, but we didn't restore it as a house museum. So when you walk in, you'll see an exhibit, but you're not going to see historic artifacts on display necessarily, because this site is used for a women's history center and for a girls leadership development center. Um, we bring students here to the house. We do lots of classroom-based programs. We have a girls advisory council that meets throughout the year and does a lot of activities. So we thought Alice Paul, she would not have wanted anything in her honor. She would want us to be doing something for equality, and that's what we do. That's what we saved her house to do. It is a living monument to, to women's history and to for the next generation of women's leaders. Now, she was born in that house in 1885, and this is her mother, Tacey Perry. 
and this is her father, William Paul. Um, they're from the, in South Jersey, the Riverton, Cinnaminson area. Um, they are um, some of the prominent Quakers of the day. Um, judge Perry, Tacey's father, was a courtroom judge, but he was also very involved in the community. We also know that in the very last years of the Civil War, um, we knew he was an abolitionist, but we didn't know that he served in the New Jersey State Legislature, and he was very outspoken as an abolitionist. I think a, a little bit of Alice Paul's activist spirit comes from, uh, from that tradition. Her uh, father, William Paul, um, met the judge's wife and married her. Now, she was uh, one of the uh, first students to go to Swarthmore College, which uh, Judge Perry had helped found. Uh, and it was a Quaker institution. Um, and what was unusual at that time was that women were allowed to go to college. Uh, in the Quaker community, men and women were created equal, well, were thought of as equal. Uh, so Tacey did attend Swarthmore College, but had to withdraw about a year later, um, about a year before she was supposed to graduate, because she got married. And at this time, married women could not attend college. But she did make a promise that she would send each of her children to college, uh, to Swarthmore for. Um, for four years, and Alice Paul ended up do, uh, going to Swarthmore and graduating. So this is Alice and her brother, uh, Billy. Um, Alice looks pretty precocious here. Um, uh, people remember she has piercing blue eyes, and uh, even at the age of 92, people can recall talking to her and seeing her eyes. Um, she was a pretty shy girl, um, and this is something with, our, with the girls that we teach leadership skills to today at Paulsdale, it's something that we tell the girls that, you know, Alice Paul was shy and she still went on to do fantastic things. Uh, you don't have to be the most outspoken person in the group to make a change. This is her brother, Billy. Uh, he ended up taking over the farm. A lot of people in our area know Billy, or knew Billy Paul uh, and some of his uh, farming and his beagles as, as well. Um, she also had two other siblings. She had a younger sister, Helen, who was a school teacher, and she had a younger brother, Perry. We don't have any family photographs of all four children, um, and she outlived all of her siblings. This is Alice as a teenager. She went to Morristown Friends School. Um, she was a very bright student, uh, top of her class. Um, she, she loved literature. She loved reading. Um, most of her teachers remember that she was very quiet, but always had a book in hand. Uh, and um, when she graduates, she grows up with these Quaker ideals that she has to make a difference in her world. Uh, so as a teenager, she started to think about what, what she's going to do with her life. Uh, I think she knows at this point um, she's probably not going to, to get married. She kind of wants to have a career first. So she um, will eventually graduate and go off to, to school and to become a social worker. Uh, I show these because um, students say they love seeing uh, the, the photographs of Alice as the athlete. Uh, she is um, in this picture and when we do our kids programs we tell them to use their detective skills to, to figure out what date this was taken. And uh, I don't know if you can see our clue here. <laughs> you can see it? Okay. Um, usually you have to have pretty good eyesight, but there is a basketball in the center that says 1905, oh, it says 05. Um, so this is her right in the front with her basketball team. And back here she is right in the back center with her field hockey team. She also played uh, tennis uh, and she also played baseball, not softball, baseball. Um, she said she was a terrible athlete, but she simply did it because she could. And in the schools that she was going to, she would have been allowed to play sports. Uh, and I think it is interesting because towards the end of her life, uh, Title IX comes about. And she, you know, she's part of that legacy of, of women who were athletes uh, who, who got to play sports very early on. And she's in this blue circle here uh, with her graduating class. And it is hard to see this banner, but this is uh, 1905. So she's graduating from Swarthmore College. And she got her degree in biology, uh, which is a, a science, but it was um, a science that not too many women would have gotten careers in. And she knew that when she was studying. Uh, so she instead goes into a career that does welcome women, and uh, that is settlement work or social work. And at this time, social work meant uh, helping immigrants coming into the cities for the first time. Uh, so she lived in New York City uh, in some of the tenement houses, and she helped uh, the, the poorest of the poor um, find health care, 
uh, I'm sorry, see a doctor, um, fill out forms in English. Uh, she taught English classes, and she even did a little uh, babysitting. It was not her favorite uh, subject, but um, <laughs> she did what she did. She could to help. And I think all of those things come into play when she gets involved in the suffrage movement. Uh, she goes to London to work as a social worker in some of the poorest districts of London, and this is where she meets these women. Uh, this is Emmeline Pankhurst. Mm -hmm. Uh, Christabel Pankhurst and Sylvia Pankhurst, uh, they are a family unit and they create uh, what is called the Women's Social and Political Union. Uh, so if you've ever seen the beginning of uh, Mary Poppins, the Disney movie Mary Poppins, where the mother has her sashes and she's singing about sister suffragette, uh, this is, people have asked me to sing that, I can't sing. Uh, so, uh, but this is what she's talking about when she's talking about Emmeline Pankhurst is clapped in irons again. Uh, this is the movement, the Women's Social and Politi Political Union. Uh, their motto was deeds, not words. Uh, so deeds meant anything that you could to get uh, your cause into the newspapers. Uh, so some of those deeds would include a little uh, vandalism. Uh, so there was a, a tactic, do not go out and do what I'm going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> so they had a tactic where the women would carry like bricks or stones in their, in their bags or in their... Um, in their bands, and they would, uh, you know, one o'clock, they would all pull out a brick and throw it through a store window. Uh, it's uh, a little dangerous, but, um, and it's probably going to get some of them arrested, but uh, the, the whole purpose of that was so that a newspaper reporter would come up to you and say, well, why did you throw that brick through the window? And you could say, you know, I did it for the cause of women's suffrage, for women to get the right to vote. Um, the women in, in the halls of Parliament, there was no discussion of women voting allowed. Uh, as a matter of fact, they would do some strategic things to drown out the, the women's suffragettes. Uh, Alice Paul, one of her tasks was to break into some of these meetings and shout, votes for women! Uh, but they would have a band playing in the background, and the band would play really, really loud, and it would drown out these women, and they would be hauled away to jail. Um, so they said, you know, we don't have a voice in the whole <coughs> government, we need to have a voice on the street. And that was part of that uh, campaign, you know, throwing some bricks through windows. Uh, Alice Paul said, you know, the windows were never hurt, uh, and, uh, you know, it did get their cause noticed, uh, some say in bad ways, uh, and they did uh, go to jail. We know that when Alice Paul was in this movement, that she was arrested at least uh, ten times between England and Scotland. Um, she did things, she sold newspapers originally, um, then she started giving speeches, which for somebody that was very shy and for a female that was never expected to be a public figure, um, this is new for her. Uh, but eventually she does rise through the ranks and uh, is with Emmeline Pankhurst as they travel on a speaking campaign throughout England and Scotland. Now, back here uh, in the United States, uh, Alice Paul's mother, Tacy, her father had passed by this point, was reading about her daughter in the newspaper and how, um, you know, she's protesting on the street and being beaten up, and then about her experience in prison. And one of the um, uh, accounts that the mother reads is about how her daughter is heard screaming through the prison. Uh, and that is because um, this movement was very brutal. Um, you can see here a suffragette is being um, beaten down and she's being pepper sprayed. It's a, like a form of pepper spray that they're using on her. And um, you can see uh, this woman, this is actually a promotional piece for the suffragette movement. Um, she's wearing a, a suffrage, I'm sorry, a prison uniform, uh, but it's actually a costume that they put together. And it's called To Prison We Went, uh, because they were very proud of the fact that they had gone to prison for what they believed in. Um, so in prison, uh, they are being uh, manhandled, we'll say, um, treated badly, uh, but also they practice a hunger strike, which is something that political groups have practiced before, the hunger strike tactic, uh, particularly the Irish. Um, so they picked up the, the tactic of the, of the hunger strike, and as a result, they were force-fed. Uh, in England, it was done two times a day, um, and you can see the process. Uh, I know you guys have had breakfast, but uh, um, they, they usually put a tube up the, the nose because they would refuse to open their mouths. Um, they put the tube down to the stomach, and then a doctor would administer um, through a funnel a mixture of raw eggs and milk. Um, so Alice Paul, she wrote to her mother at one point, um, 
uh, the holidays were coming up in December 1909, and she sent her mother all of these wonderful letters about, um, thee need not worry about me. I had a wonderful time in prison. <laughs> I caught up on all my reading and uh, my letter writing, um, and everything was great. So she sends these letters to her mother throughout the holidays, but it's in January where she tells her mother, um, the doctor has been to see me, and I think I can get up and walk tomorrow. So she had to let on to her mother the result of the hunger strike and forced feeding process were so brutal that she was uh, in bed for the entire month of, of December. Uh, and she did describe to her mother what the process was like. Um, she says, you know, she's tied down, she's held down, uh, they put sheets around her body to hold her still. Um, her head is being held down, uh, she's gagging, she's gasping for air, uh, her nose is bleeding, uh, she's constantly vomiting, um, and she says this is truly a form of torture, and this is what these women had to go through because they wanted the right to vote. Now, in Alice's mind, she never understood why people were so hostile to women voting. Um, she had been raised in a community where men and women both had the same uh, opportunities and the same voice in their community. Um, so she really didn't understand why people were so upset about the concept of women being political, of, of voting. She comes back to the United States in uh, January 1910. Uh, she goes right back into um, grad school. She goes to the University of Pennsylvania, and she gets her uh, master's officially in social work and her doctorate in economics. Um, and uh, she's wearing a pin. It's very hard to see in this picture on her collar. It is a, a jail gate pin. Uh, it's called the Holloway brooch, and it's something that she earned in England uh, from going to Holloway prison multiple times. Uh, and it was given to suffragettes who went to prison. Uh, so she's going to create a version of that for American suffragists. When she's in the United States, she's a celebrity because uh, of what she had done in England. It was very scandalous, actually, for the time. But um, the American suffragists are kind of looking at Alice Paul, and they want to hear from her. They really want to hear about the hunger strike. But um, the leaders of the American movement, they do not want the version of the English suffrage movement in the country. Um, so the leaders at this time are Reverend Anna Howard Shaw, and uh, Carrie Chapman Catt, who's going to become the next president. Uh, she did not like Alice Paul. Um, she's a much younger woman, uh, college educated, which um, women are starting to go to college in bigger numbers in the early 1900s. Uh, so, and then somebody that was radical, uh, she was called a militant suffragist. Uh, militant meaning that she's taking on all of these actions that are getting her arrested uh, against the law. Um, so they meet with Alice, she goes on a speaking tour up and down the East Coast, uh, everyone's fascinated, but when Alice Paul graduates and decides she wants to work in Washington, D.C. for the suffrage movement, um, she's told, you know, we're glad to have you, but we don't want any of your militant militancy here in the United States. Um, so they give her, she says, you know, let me focus on Congress and focus on passing a federal amendment for women to have the right to vote. Um, there's a lot of difference of opinion on how women should get the right to vote at this time. Um, some suffragists think it should be a state issue. Um, Susan B. Anthony, who had come a generation before Alice, she thought it was a federal issue. And in fact, she was one of the last women to work on a federal campaign, and she had passed in 1906. Uh, so, um, Alice is really one of the first people to pick this up again, and she literally inherits uh, Susan B. Anthony's dusty old desk uh, um, when she picks up the work for a federal campaign. Now, Alice learned her tactic from England, uh, which is to focus on Parliament, so she says, I'm going to focus on government, I'm going to focus on these uh, gentlemen, and one woman, uh, and uh, get them to, you know, to consider the 19th Amendment, and I'm going to put a lot of pressure on the President, because he is the number one representative that represents our law and represents Congress, and he can influence Congress. Um, so we can have debates about that today. But, um, you know, back in, in the early 19-teens, uh, um, the country is very, it's changing. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of progressive ideas, there's a lot of reform-minded ideals, and uh, she's really at the cusp of, uh, of everything that's happening in the United States. So she begins uh, her own party. She's given $10 and a list of names, and 
ten dollars doesn't go far, and that list of names, most of the people on that list were dead or had moved out of the city. So she had to start really over again. Um, she established her headquarters in the basement of a dusty old building, and she's right in the center of this picture. You can see that she's much younger than some of the women that she's working with. Uh, at this point, she's in her early thirties. Um, and she pulls together a team, and she does it very quickly, because uh, from January to March of 1913, uh, she has to organize a huge parade. And I think that the, the, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, she calls the National, um, I think those leaders expected her to just pull together like a hundred women and have a little parade in Washington, D.C. Um, instead, uh, she is going to pull together over 6,000, or sorry, over 8,000 men and women to come and march. So she did things on a much grander scale than anybody ever expected with her $10. Um, she is, this is, I, I like these pictures because they're symbolic of the women that you see here. Uh, this is Alice, she's at headquarters, she's at her desk, she, her Susan B. Anthony desk. Um, everything's a mess, she's on the phone, she's always working. And this is Alice Paul. She was a workaholic, um, she's the strategist, she's, uh, people called her the commander. Um, she was good at corresponding, uh, she used technology in the best ways um, to spread what she thought was a positive message. And she's reaching out in this uh, picture to get women to come to this uh, parade. Uh, here's her friend Lucy Burns. Uh, she is the uh, fiery redhead from Brooklyn. Uh, they had met in prison in England. Uh, they were both Americans and, and connected right away. Um, and where Alice was shy, Lucy was more out, out I don't want to say outspoken, uh, well-spoken. Um, she was uh, daring. And here she's doing a little publicity for the upcoming parade. She's dropping leaflets from the sky in this uh, early er, aeroplane. Um, so uh, Lucy and, and Alice were a team, kind of like their, their foremothers, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who had worked uh, in, a, in a very integral way. So nobody expected, everyone thought 100 women marching down uh, a, a little street in, in Washington, D.C. Instead, Alice turns it into 8,000 men and women marching down Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, the chief of police wasn't happy about this because it was held on uh, March 3rd, 1913, the day before uh, Woodrow Wilson's first inaugural parade. It was, his is supposed to be on March 4th. But she wants the third because she says, we just celebrated the anniversary just this week. Um, she says, you know, the press will be in town and the people are going to be in town and the people are going to be celebrating. So she wanted her parade on March 3rd. The chief of police says, you know, just do your thing, but do it on a side street. She demands uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. So he says, okay, you know, you ladies can, can march down the street, whatever. Um, but he really doesn't expect uh, the, the audience that comes out that day. So this is the beginning of the parade. You can see um, women on horseback. You can see a nice open uh, street. Um, uh, here you can see a little bit more of the crowd that turns out. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the audience that day was um, uh, perhaps a little intoxicated. Uh, you know, it's a tradition for inaugural events to, or any political events, to go to the saloon and drink. Um, so these guys, I'm going to say guys because the women did not do this. Uh, they, they, you know, are hanging out in the saloons and then they come out and they see this parade. And at the beginning of the parade, um, the first banner says, we demand the enfranchisement of women. Uh, we demand the right to vote. We're not asking for the right to vote. We're not pleading. We're not going to be polite about it. We are demanding the right to vote. So automatically, there's uh, a lot of hostility there. There's a society that doesn't believe necessarily that women should be voting, and that includes women and men. Um, so they are hostile, and there's parts of the parade where there's not enough police presence uh, because the chief of police, he said, I'm going to have my police staff work on March 4th, this, this March 3rd parade, I don't have to worry about. Um, so here you can start to see more of the, the crowd, uh, and eventually um, uh, some of the bystanders start to heckle the marchers and throw things at them, and eventually it, it erupts into a full riot. They, they tear down their banners and kick and punch them. And about 100 women went to the hospital as a result of uh, the riot during the parade. Um, so, you know, they, they, they tried their best to, to pull together the nicest floats. Um, they have women marching, uh, go back to this picture, in purple, white, and gold. Um, they have women marching in their traditional dress because Alice was very good 
at incorporating those immigrant women that she had worked with uh, early on, uh, factory wage earner women uh, as well. And she was also good, uh, in a way, at getting uh, African American women involved. They were allowed to have membership in what's going to become her party, although there's some hostility here because Southern white women refused to march if the African American women were allowed to march. So Alice solved it by um, putting a contingent of uh, men, actually, uh, that march uh, in between the southern white women and the black women. But one uh, woman, uh, she, uh, Ida B. Wells, as we know her, Ida Wells Barnett, um, she said, I'm not marching in the back of this parade. And she, she joined the parade much earlier. So. About 100 women went to the hospital that day, and a letter was sent from a suffragist that said to President Wilson, you know, as you come in, uh, because when he came into the city for the first time, um, there was no crowd to greet him, because they were all over on Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah. <laughs> so he's not happy about that. But, um, you know, a letter is sent to him that says, you know, as you ride up Pennsylvania Avenue for your first inaugural parade, uh, remember that 100 women lay bleeding in the street because they wanted the right to vote. And that's how Alice Paul introduces herself to, to Woodrow Wilson. Um, she uh, begins her own newspaper, and uh, she's also raised a lot of money at this point in 1913. She turned that $10 into $26,000, uh, which is a lot of money today, but it would have been a huge amount of money in 1913. Um, she also starts sending groups of women uh, to, as deputations to meet with the president. And um, President Wilson was not a supporter of women's suffrage, uh, at least initially. Um, he uh, did some things like, there was one time where she sent a group to meet with him, and she, he, he lined them up in, at, at desk like they were school children, and he kind of talked down to them. And he would always say the same thing, ladies, you know, you're so lovely, uh, but I just don't think that this is an issue that our country should be dealing with. Uh, we have um, economic issues, and we have a war on the horizon. Um, you know, we, we have more pressing issues. Uh, so this is a, an interesting theme that occurs uh, throughout women's history. So by the end of 1913, um, the, the leaders, particularly Carrie Chapman Catt of the national movement, they say, you know, we don't want your type of, of, of suffrage activity in the United States, and they were also very upset that that $26,000 had not come to the, to the national movement. It was part of the D.C. branch. Uh, and Alice said, you know, you told me to raise my own money, you told me not to ask for any money, so I raised my own money. Um, so I think really what the, the head of the issue at this point is um, that uh, there's a lot of generational differences between these two factions. Um, I think that Alice and Lucy, as the young college women, uh, you know, they, they had careers. Um, they were used to working with different classes of women. Um, and I think they had a very different idea for what kind of suffrage movement they wanted to lead, uh, focusing on the, the federal amendment. Uh, so they were kicked out of the national. Alice Paul will found what she eventually calls the National Women's Party. And the National Women's Party has a little bit more of an aggressive campaign. Um, one of the things that Alice Paul does in 1916 is she sends uh, suffragists out west to the states where women could vote, uh, states like Washington and California and Oregon. Uh, they had given women the right to vote right from the get-go. When they became states, you know, they need to show their population in order to become states. So they counted women amongst their population. And these pioneer women, they were part of the community uh, and recognized as, as uh, strong leaders in the community uh, from the beginning. So they did have the right to vote. Uh, it was women on the East Coast uh, uh, that did not have the right to vote. So Alice Paul said, women out West, um, let's, uh, let's show that we have a voting block. Um, let's vote against Democratic candidates running for office in 1916. Um, so this is going to be a, a huge challenge to the, to the Democratic Party. Uh, but Alice says, you know, it's the Democratic Party that's holding up this amendment. They have it uh, in, in Congress, but they won't discuss it. They won't bring it out to the floor for a vote. Um, so she encourages women out west to vote against Democratic candidates. Now, by the end of that speaking tour, um, a lot of historians today say that it didn't have a big impact. They might have unseated a couple of Democratic uh, senators, but not a lot. Uh, I actually have done research, and I argue the opposite, that no, this, is a, this was a, 
a really good movement. It did show that women had some influence on elections, uh, but it also forced politicians to, to address the issue of suffrage. Uh, women's suffrage was something that they could ignore. They could not give any comment on it, whereas by 1916, they have to have it on their party platform. They have to address whether they are for or against women's suffrage in some way. And I think that's what Alice Paul did. I think she pushed the envelope to, to make sure people, um, particularly in public office, would make a statement um, for suffrage. So this picture is taken in 1916. This is January, I'm sorry, 1917. Um, and uh, President Wilson, uh, they had just met with him for the last time. And he said, look, you know, we're, at a, we're in a war. Um, and he organized a meeting of some of the national leaders of the suffrage movement, including Carrie Chapman Catt and Alice Paul. And he said, because we're in a war, if you, if you stop your suffrage activities and focus, let us work, focus on the war effort and support us, um, we'll give you the right to vote after the war, in, in simplistic terms. Uh, and everyone agreed, of course, except for Alice Paul. Um, as, as, as a Quaker, she was uh, a pacifist. Um, she wouldn't have supported the war anyway. But uh, she said, you know, we've been told this before. Um, President Lincoln told uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony that if they supported the war, um, we would get the right to vote after. And we've been waiting ever since. Um, she also said something interesting to President Wilson. She said, you know, you are encouraging our country to fight a war for democracy. But a true democracy is where people have the right to vote. And one half of your entire country has no say in their government. How could you call that a model of democracy? So she begins uh, her protest, which she's most known for. Um, this is a picketing campaign of the White House. Um, it is a silent uh, protest. Uh, it's a peaceful protest. Uh, she starts it in January, and they're going to be out there through November of 1917, six days a week, from sunup to sundown. If you were part of Alice Paul's National <laughs> Party, you would sign up for a shift about four hours, and you'd be out there in any kind of weather. So the snow that we had this past week, you'd be out there, uh, freezing cold, and uh, the, the, the temperatures, whatever they are, they're out there. Um, and it's going to be a particularly hot summer in D.C., it usually is. Uh, so, you know, this is a huge uh, task to, to, um, uh, for these women to get involved in, uh, particularly knowing that they are protesting uh, during a war, um, and that this is the first time anybody's ever protested in front of the White House before. Uh, most people don't know that because we're used to seeing uh, protesters in front of the White House today, uh, but this is the first group that had done it. Um, and it's a peaceful protest, so we learn about Gandhi and Martin Luther King and their peaceful protest um, and their passive resistance. But Alice was practicing that uh, here in 1917. So their banners do the talking. They have purple, white, and gold banners. And uh, they have white banners that have uh, messages to the president. Uh, Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? Will you support our amendment? Uh, and Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And these are the last words of uh, Inez Milholland, who was one of the women that was in that parade. Uh, she was, uh, the Milholland's of New York were a very uh, elite family. She was a lawyer and an activist. Uh, but she had led that 1913 parade. She was known as one of the most beautiful women in America. Um, and she had gone out west in 1916 to speak on behalf of women's suffrage. And she collapsed and she died a few weeks later uh, of a, a related cause, but uh, really she was just worn out from her speaking campaign. So Alice Paul turns her into the logo for the National Women's Party, and she turns her words into uh, the, the banner for one of the first... Uh, protest in front of the White House. This is college day on the picket line. Um, it's hard to see their sashes, but they have colleges. The University of Missouri is here. Uh, Swarthmore College, uh, Alice Paul had gone there. Um, uh, um, Leland Stanford is here. Um, so this is college day, but they also had New Jersey day on the picket line. Uh, they did have a Delaware and a Pennsylvania day. Uh, they also had a wage earners day for those factory women that came out, and they were a huge help. Uh, in supporting um, some of these, these picketing campaigns. 
By April of 1917, we are um, elbow deep in, in war, um, and President Wilson is uh, making radio speeches in support of the war. And so Alice Paul takes his words and puts them on her banners. Um, so this is one of his most famous speeches. Uh, we shall fight for the things we have always carried nearest our hearts, for democracy, for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their government. So this is April 1917. <laughs> So you see what Alice is doing here. She's saying, look, you know, we submit to authority. Uh, women have to pay taxes. Women have to abide by the law. Um, women have to obey uh, every rule and every law, uh, financially and legally, uh, whether they're widowed or not, um, whether they're married or not. Uh, so we submit to authority. We should be able to have a voice in our government. That's what a democracy truly is. At this point, um, there are uh, advisors to uh, President Wilson, and they say, um, you know, you've got to get these women off of your front porch. Um, you know, they're getting a lot of press. Uh, so he did order a news blackout, but um, some of the newspapers just ignored his orders. Uh, the New York Times was notorious for printing uh, some of the suffragist pictures from 1917. Eventually, uh, Wilson says, that's it, um, arrests the women. Uh, so the police come in after a, 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 a protest um, had broken out into um, some violence. Uh, it was actually a group of soldiers, um, sailors, that had attacked the women um, and tore down their banners. And somebody even fired a gun at them. Uh, but the women were, the suffragists were all arrested immediately. None of the, the attackers uh, that day. Um, so they are arrested and they are put in um, a, to a court uh, a trial where the um, uh, judge says, you know, if you pay a fee, I think it was ten dollars, um, you know, we'll, we'll release you. And they said, you know, we're not going to admit our guilt. Their charge was obstructing sidewalk traffic. <laughs> so he said, you know, pay this fee and we'll let you go. Um, they said, you know, we haven't been arrested for obstructing sidewalk traffic. We're not going to pay a dime because that would be admitting guilt to something we didn't do. Uh, so instead they were sent, many were sent to the Occoquan Workhouse in Virginia. Um, some were sent to the district jail. Alice Paul was arrested in October 1917. Uh, she was given eight months in jail, again for the charge of obstructing sidewalk traffic. So here's Lucy Burns. Um, she was arrested actually more times than any American suffragist or any English suffragette. Uh, she was arrested, and every time she got out of jail, she'd go home, clean up, and go right to the press. Um, she wanted to report on what happened in jail and, again, support the cause. So when Alice is arrested, she has this protest uh, that says, you know, we demand that Alice Paul be treated as a political prisoner. Um, this is an interesting uh, tactic because in the United States, we're not supposed to have political prisonership status in our jails because you're not supposed to be arrested for your political beliefs. So when they're asking that Alice Paul be treated as a political prisoner, uh, they know that she's not going to be. It's more, of a, it's more of a statement that she was arrested for her politics and not for uh, her protest. These are some press photos, uh, which I think are interesting. Um, the top, I'm sorry, these two are. Um, because they're trying to show in these photos that the women are healthy and that they're fine. Uh, this one of Lucy Burns even shows her reading a newspaper and she's got her, um, I think she's got knitting in her hands. Uh, but this was not the actual um, uh, treatment in, in, in prison. Um, their conditions were uh, pretty awful. Uh, at Aquacon Workhouse, uh, I'm told that uh, it was supposed to be shut down at some point, but because they had so many groups of suffragists being arrested every day, that they kept the workhouse open for these women. Um, it was extremely hot during the day, extremely cold at night. Uh, I'm also told that they only wash the linens, uh, the uniforms and their linens, uh, once a year. Um, and that, you know, you were given a bucket of water that you had to share um, with several women and just a bar of soap to bathe. Uh, and one uh, rodents, um, maggots, um, weevils. Uh, they actually had a game um, when they were eating their slop soup or whatever it was uh, of who had who had the most weevils in their oh, in their no. soup. Um, and it was just one of the ways that they kind of stuck together in the prison and they kept each other's spirits up. They sang songs. Um, they played games. They passed messages to each other. 
but um, you know the conditions inside the prison were bad. One of the worst things that happened was uh, in the cells they did have toilets, but they're not like our flush toilets today. The wardens are supposed to flush them out with a bucket of water every day. Uh, but there's a real effort on behalf of the wardens to to make these women give up and go home. Uh, so they weren't cleaning out the the toilet facilities, uh, and um, conditions are pretty dire at this point. When Alice is arrested, uh, she's immediately separated. She's put into the district jail, and um, she decides to go on hunger strike. Uh, and when she goes on hunger strike, uh, there's 166 women that went to prison that year, the suffragists. Uh, about 30 of them are going to follow her in the hunger strike. Now, keep in mind, she knows what's going to happen. Uh, it's something that she dreads. Uh, even at the age of 92, um, there are nurses that talk about remembering her screaming about this process of being force-fed. So it was truly a form of torture that she had gone through. But she makes the decision to go on hunger strike, knowing that that is what's going to happen to her. And indeed, that's what starts. Um, in the United States, this is done three times a day. Um, if you want to keep somebody that's hunger striking alive, you only need to feed them maybe once or twice a week. Uh, so the feeding them, force feeding them three times a day, was really an effort to make them give up. Um, she describes, again, the, the force feeding in the newspapers. Um, and uh, she also talks about what the wardens are doing. Uh, they are putting, like, fruit in front of these women uh, and saying, you know, your friend has eaten. You should give up your hunger strike. Uh, and at one point, uh, they put baked pies in front of them. And then uh, at another day, they fried chicken in front of their cells to make them give up uh, and go home. So. Um, in this bottom picture, you can see some of the results of the hunger strike and the conditions inside the cells. Uh, they managed to stick together and they all pulled their sleeping uh, mats uh, out into the main floor um, and just lay there. Uh, there's nothing else that they can do. They're too weak from the hunger strike. Uh, and because they stuck together, there's nothing that the wardens can do at this point either. So eventually, the, the public is starting to hear about what's happening in the prisons, uh, particularly with the forced feeding. Uh, it's coming out in drips and drabs uh, through, the, through the press, through notes that are snuck out of prison, uh, and eventually President Wilson starts to get a lot of negative publicity from this. Uh, so a lot of people are saying, you know, this is the United States of America. We're supposed to be a great country, but yet we're beating up our, our, our women because they, they simply want the right to vote. And also at this point, um, sorry. Reminding me not to talk too long. Um, uh, also, at this point, a lot of uh, countries are starting to give women the right to vote. Uh, uh, Britain had given women limited suffrage. Um, France had given women suffrage. Uh, I think Germany had given women suffrage at this point. And uh, Russia, which we've got our eye on Russia at this point, uh, they gave women the right to vote very early on. Uh, so at this point, the United States is kind of falling behind on our human policy. And uh, you know we're starting to look like we're, we're kind of old and, and maybe too traditional. Um, so at this point, people are saying we shouldn't be beating up women for this idea of, of voting. Uh, maybe it's time to consider um, passing this amendment. Uh, when um, Wilson orders the release of all of these prisoners, um, a lot of them are so weak that they can, be, they can only be carried out in litters. Uh, but Alice Paul, she says, the government has used its heaviest weapon, and we have won. Uh, meaning, you know, they can't do anything but kill us at this point. And uh, they've already tried to put us down in the strongest way that they could. Uh, so there's nothing else to do now but pass this amendment. She gives each of the women that uh, went to jail, 166 of them, the Jail for Freedom pin. It is based on the pin that she had gotten in England, that Holloway brooch. Uh, and every once in a while, you'll see one of these pins pop up. There's one on display at the Smithsonian sometimes. Uh, family members will find these pins and wonder, you know, where do these come from? And they're usually from an aunt or a great grandmother who was a suffragist, uh, which not too many families were proud of uh, throughout history. It takes a while um, for, for women to officially get the right to vote. Uh, President Wilson does address Congress, uh, and uh, the Senate, pa I'm sorry, the House passes it, but the Senate doesn't initially. It takes another year um, for women get, to get the right to vote after they are released. Uh, so eventually, Congress does pass uh, the 19th Amendment, and it goes to the states for ratification. 
Uh, so in 1919, it did pretty good getting uh, the 36 states that it needed to be ratified. Uh, but by uh, summer of 1919, um, the ratification process has really slowed down. And it comes up to a lot of southern states, uh, which are very against women's suffrage. Uh, the southern ideology was that women needed to be cared for uh, by the men in their lives. Uh, so Tennessee was one of the states that decided to vote on the suffrage issue, and they were originally um, expected to vote against the amendment. Uh, when uh, the suffragists arrived at this, the state house that day, a lot more men were wearing red roses on their lapel, which meant they were anti-suffragists, than yellow roses, which meant they were for suffrage. Uh, so a very young man, 24-year-old Harry Byrne, he got a letter from his mother the day before the vote that told him to do right by the ladies and put the rat in ratification. So he took off his red rose and he changed his vote to yay. Uh, and that one wo vote, wow. one vote changed uh, history forever. Uh, so when Tennessee passed it, um, uh, it went uh, to be signed officially on August 26, 1920. And that's what's happening in this picture. Alice is celebrating. Um, actually, these are press photos. She did these much earlier than August because uh, she wanted her photos in the paper before Carrie Chapman Katz, uh, which I think is kind of fun. Uh, she's very smart, very strategic. Uh, but she is celebrating by unfurling a purple, white, and gold banner that uh, has stars representing each of the states that would ratify that amendment. At that time, 36 states. These women are celebrating. They're saying, yay, women have the right to vote. We've done our job. They pack up and go home. Alice Paul says, no, your vote is just your foot in the door. Uh, you have so much more that we need to work for. Um, women have a legal right to vote, but in the Constitution, that's all they have. Technically, it's the only thing that mentions women. Um, she knew from uh, an earlier trial with Susan B. Anthony, uh, that women were not specifically uh, named in the Constitution. And that's what Susan Anthony was told uh, back in 1872 when she tried to vote, that uh, the 14th Amendment uh, that said that she was a citizen and was guaranteed the rights of citizenship because she was born in this country was not valid to her specifically. It didn't say anything about a woman. Uh, so Alice Paul says, if this is what Susan Anthony was told in 1872, we need to make sure that the Constitution says something specifically about women have these rights too. So when this picture is being taken, she's already working on uh, the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, she wrote the ERA uh, in 1923, just a few years after this picture uh, is taken. Um, she's wearing her Jail for Freedom pin on her um, waistband here. She's celebrating with a glass of grape juice. This is a yes. if she didn't drink, but also prohibition had passed by this point. Mm -hmm. She goes right back to law school. Um, she earns uh, another set of uh, uh, doctorate uh, degree uh, in uh, law. She's more of a legal scholar at this point because she had written the Equal Rights Amendment, but she's working with a team to try to determine how this is going to affect women in different states. And her dissertation is actually very interesting uh, for American University. Um, she does research state by state by state to see how the laws change for women. And sometimes it was pretty dramatic. Uh, whereas in New Jersey, a woman might be able to own property when she crossed the state lines uh, into uh, Delaware and then into Maryland, uh, she would lose that right. Um, and sometimes it was uh, very dramatic, uh, the rights that she might have had versus uh, if she moved to a different state. So obviously Alice Paul is supportive of a, a federal amendment to give women across the United States the same uh, exact rights. Um, she's working in the United States for the ERA, uh, which she starts in 1923. Uh, she's lobbying, she's producing her own newspaper, The Equal Rights, with this gentleman down here is reading. Um, she's really getting to know uh, the, the legislators of the day, uh, both local, state, and national legislators. She actually started a card index uh, for all of these politicians. Um, she would keep track of how they voted, uh, where they lived, what their kids' names were, what pets they had. Um, and actually, this actually uh, is uh, really famous now at her old headquarters because uh, she started this card index, which was, uh, some people say, more in-depth than the IRS. Uh, so she, uh, she knew who everyone was and who they were voting for. Um, so she was very busy in the United States, but she's also busy on the international scene. Uh, she is following the League of Nations uh, wherever they're meeting. Uh, so they're usually at The Hague or um, they're in uh, Switzerland or 
in Europe at different locations, sometimes in London. Uh, so she's following them and she's reminding them, you know, you're, you're creating this great legislation, but you're not talking about women specifically. Uh, you need to include women in all of your decisions. Um, so she's working internationally here. She sets up her headquarters for the World Women's Party here uh, at Villa Bartholoni, and this is in uh, Geneva. And um, she's very active meeting with uh, peace activists, uh, with uh, women's organizations, uh, in addition to some of the international uh, legal organizations that are just starting to set up. As the Second World War approaches, um, she uh, has an experience with uh, a Jewish family. Um, she had hired a woman, her name is Alison Muller, to translate for her. Um, despite her best attempts, she could never learn a different language. So Alice Muller is a Jewish woman, and Alice's uh, husband, uh, Alice Muller's husband, was uh, put into uh, an early concentration camp. Um, I don't know how he got out, but he came out and he said to Alice Paul, you know, this is going to be a, a, a really bad uh, movement for, for the Jews. Um, you know, we're going to be per persecuted, we're going to be killed. Um, she didn't understand why, she said, you know, why, she didn't understand the reasoning behind it, uh, but I think she understood even early on that uh, um, there was going to be a, a mass slaughter of, of, uh, of Jewish individuals and, and other individuals as well. Um, she actually had the Mueller family stay with her uh, kind of quietly here at this headquarters. She also brought in, and this is information that we're just finding out, um, over 12 uh, dozen um, individuals and families, Jewish individuals, uh, a lot of them intellectuals, uh, that were being persecuted by the Nazis. And she got them all out of the country. She used her connection to the United States to get them passage, many of them to New Jersey. Uh, and we know the Mullers actually settled in Atco, New Jersey. <laughs> so she does this good deed. We're still learning about how she helped uh, dozens and dozens of uh, Jews and uh, their families. Um, and it's going to come around in the end of her life. She does have to get out of Europe as well. She comes back to the United States. She's working on the Equal Rights Amendment. And she also, in the 1960s, uh, is credited for um, influencing uh, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, Title VII is uh, the only legislation that would address sex or women in its legislation uh, for, for a long time. Um, she is also, uh, as the 70s approach, uh, Congress does eventually pass, Congre uh, pass the ERA, and she's a celebrity once again. She doesn't like it. Uh, but, um, you know, she basically, she retires when she can't walk up these steps anymore at her headquarters. She goes back to a uh, house that she has in Richfield, Connecticut, uh, to live out her years. Um, and she wants to be in Connecticut, too, so that she can get to New York um, for any meetings of the UN. Uh, or she can get to Montreal if she needs to for any um, uh, uh, meetings there. Um, by the late 70s, uh, she's had a stroke, um, and her only surviving relative is her nephew, who didn't treat her too badly. In fact, uh, I'm sorry, he didn't treat her too well. Uh, he squandered her estate, and he left her in a pretty uh, penniless uh, state uh, at the end of her life, uh, which is interesting because here she is fighting for legislation for women to have control of their finances, and she lost it uh, at the end of her life. Um, it was the Mueller family that were relatives over in Europe that read about her condition uh, at the end of her life, and they wrote to the Mullers uh, here in New Jersey, and they said, you need to help Alice Paul. So they did approach um, uh, friends meetings in New Jersey, uh, and they eventually raised enough money to have her transported from uh, Connecticut to the Greenleaf Nursing Home in Moorestown, New Jersey. If you come and visit us, you can see the, the Greenleaf as well. Um, so she lives out her last uh, about a half year there, uh, and when she has her 91st birth, I'm sorry, her 92nd birthday, um, one of the things that is interesting is that reporters want to talk to her, but she, um, she wants to focus on the URA, so she'll tell a reporter, you know, I'll talk to you, but you've got to call three representatives first and get them to support the URA. Uh, so this is the <laughs> challenge that she gives to these reporters and to, to women's groups that want to meet with her. Um, so uh, there's a story where um, uh, Betty Ford wants to give her a birthday congratulations call, um, and she says, I'm not doing it not doing it, because she knows it's a press event. Um, so eventually the nurses encourage her to, to pick up the phone and talk with uh, the First Lady. And um, she picks up, 
Betty, I've been waiting for you to call all day. Um, so what is your husband going to do to support the ERA? Uh, so she, she didn't hold back in any way. Um, there's also a story, uh, the nurses tell me that it was Valentine's Day, uh, and uh, they wanted her to come down for a party, and she said, nope, ain't doing it. And then they told her that they were going to have a political rally for the ERA. So they bring her down, and she sees these hearts hanging up on the ceiling. She said, this is no rally, and she said, take me upstairs. Um, so you can see that she is constantly, she's making phone calls for the ERA. She's constantly working for it. When she died in July of 1977, uh, the ERA had three more states that needed to pass the, uh, the to become an official amendment. It needed 38 states. Uh, it had 30, just had, about had 35. Um, she had a feeling, because it was given such a short deadline, uh, that it wasn't going to pass. Um, amendments, uh, the, the uh, idea of giving an amendment a deadline was pretty new, uh, and an eight-year deadline was way too short. And they extended it to ten years, uh, but she said, "You know, that's not going to pass." Um, we have had amendments that took over a hundred years, and they became valid amendments. So she says, "You know, this ten-year thing." Uh, she has a feeling it's not going to pass, and she was she was right. Unfortunately, um, the Equal Rights Amendment uh, is officially uh, said it was supposed to ratify by 1982 it was the latest deadline, uh, but it fell three states short. It never got those last three states uh, to become an official document. Now, we carry out our work for the Equal Rights Amendment, but let me tell you what we do at the house. Um, these are some of our girls. These are actually dated pictures because these girls are now through college and starting their first jobs. But we do have a Girls Advisory Council. Today it's over 40 girls, uh, high school age, and they um, represent the Institute at conferences, women's studies conferences, girls conferences. They're getting ready to host a big one in Philadelphia uh, this spring. Um, we have taken them to the UN for the International Day of the Girl, which is celebrated in October. Uh, we've taken them to DC. They've actually lobbied for the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, and they're just a very active group. Right now, they're raising money for girls in Pakistan uh, who would like to go to school. Um, so they're doing fundraisers. Uh, and, um, you know, these are truly our, our next generation of Alice Falls. They're uh, never heard no before, and um, they, they believe in. Equality. It's something that they were raised with, uh, helping people and, and just being part of your community. Um, this is something that they have been raised with and, and they want to continue. Uh, we also have our history programs. Uh, this is one of our more popular ones called Meeting Alice. It's for fourth grade students, uh, where the students um, learn about Alice Paul, but they, we focus on civics and the importance of voting and being a good citizen. Uh, so here you see the uh, boys and girls are arranging kind of a timeline of her life, and they do uh, fun things at the, the house. And of course, we work with Girl Scouts. We work with Boy Scouts too, uh, but we tend to get more Girl Scout groups that do a lot of our programs and uh, uh, and take part. And they eventually grow up to become part of our Girls Advisory Council, which is a nice legacy for us uh, with the girls that we work with. So there are movements today for the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, there's two movements. Uh, one is to get the three states that needed to ratify to, to ratify uh, and to have it be valid. Um, the other movement is to get all 38 states to re to ratify again. Uh, so um, uh, there are some supporters. I, I know Senator Menendez uh, is a supporter of reintroducing the whole document again. Um, uh, Carol, Carolyn Maloney of New York, uh, she is a supporter of both strategies, but to reintroduce the amendment again. Um, so there is uh, pressure. Um, I know the president has recently announced his support of the Paycheck Fairness Act, um, which is a step in the right direction. Uh, but a lot of people say, you know, hey, we've got economic issues, we've got a war, um, we've got all these more pressing issues, which is the same thing Alice Paul was told, uh, and which is the same thing Susan B. Anthony was told. Um, so the issue of, of women's rights, uh, it seems as a marginal issue when women today are almost 52% of the country. Uh, so um, I think uh, it's a changing time. I think uh, a lot of things have happened, but if Alice Paul were here today, uh, she would have stopped the presentation in its first minute and put you all to work in <laughs> some way on the Equal Rights Amendment. She would have had you on social media. She would have had you shaking people's hands uh, in Trenton. Uh, she would have had you on the phones, uh, making posters, making flyers. She would have done everything she could have to, to bring attention to what she called uh, ordinary quality. A reporter actually asked her one time at the end of her life, you know, uh, 
what's going to change when women have their rights? And she says, you know, when women have rights, when men have rights, it's none of our business as long as you have them. Uh, she says, uh, in life, um, uh, sometimes things are considered complicated, but I consider nothing complicated about ordinary equality. And that's our Alice Paul. That's why we uh, celebrate her today. So this is our website. I do encourage you to visit alicepaul.org. You can see um, some of the events that we have coming up for the Institute. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about is, um, I have the brochure on the back table there. Um, we are actually raising money for our first exhibit at Paulsdale. Um, we started right away with our, our leadership center and our history center. And uh, we actually had more and more tourists that want to visit the site, which we love. Uh, so we never had an exhibit before. So we, we're just starting that. Um, we have raised about uh, three quarters of the money. Um, and we did get a grant from uh, the New Jersey Historical Commission. Um, so we are uh, just raising the last quarter of that money. Um, our Indiegogo camp, I'm going to do some advertising here. Our Indiegogo online campaign for the exhibit, it actually ends on Wednesday, which is uh, March 11th. Uh, so if you'd like to support the Alice Paul exhibit, uh, it's a great way to, to honor history and, and to preserve women's history at Paulsdale. Um, we have a program for teen girls that is called the APPLY program, the Alice Paul Professional Leadership Institute. And it's for high school girls to give them some early professional development skills. Uh, this is before they go to college. Um, so we're going to introduce them. We just ran a program on uh, powerful speaking. Um, we're going to run another program just a couple weeks on resume writing. Uh, so we're trying to introduce high school girls, ninth grade girls, um, to uh, different careers that they might be interested in and different colleges that they would be interested in very early on so that we can get them geared up for college while they're in high school. A lot of girls uh, and boys actually don't realize uh, until like their senior year uh, that they need so many things to get into college. Um, so we're running our weekend workshops throughout the year for the teen girls and we're running our college and careers program during the summer. They're one week institutes. Uh, we have a lot going on. We have cultural programs uh, throughout the year. Um, we have a huge celebration in the summer for Women's Equality Day, the day that women got the right to vote. So come out and uh, celebrate with us on the lawn at Paulsdale. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, which has happened. Uh, we have had a couple cases. Uh, it's going to be very hard to prove in court. And she doesn't, I'm not a legal, um, I'm not an attorney, so I, uh, I can only tell you what Alice Paul would have said. Um, but uh, she would have said, you know, it's going to be very hard to, to have a case in court and to uh, have anything to back you up in the Constitution. You're not going to get the strict scrutiny that you would need. Um, uh, and uh, it's going to be very hard to go to the Supreme Court level as well. Um, we have had a Supreme Court case, uh, the Lily Ledbetter case versus the Goodyear Company, where she did sue because she was getting paid less than the least experienced male manager. Um, she did not win her case. Uh, there was a 180-day statute. If you feel like you were being discriminated, you, have to, you originally had to file a, uh, a claim within 180 days of the time that you were hired. So that's only a few months. Uh, it's hard to find out if you're even getting paid less than your coworkers to begin with, let, to, let alone to do that in the first four months of your employment. Uh, so one of the things, uh, President Obama, one of the first things he did when he was elected was he signed uh, the Ledbetter Act to get rid of that 180-day statute. Uh, but other than that, there is an Equal Pay Act that passed in 1963. It has very li little legal standing. Uh, it doesn't have any teeth uh, to back up uh, if a corporation is paying a woman less or um, if money is being used unfairly. Uh, so, you know, Alice Paul would say, you need that the supreme law of the land, you need that constitution, which says, uh, you know, women are part of this document. Uh, New Jersey did pass an Equal Rights Amendment that simply amended the state constitution and said, this constitution is valid for women. Uh, so she said, you need, that, you need that written in there. If you don't have it in there, um, any judge can interpret in any way he, feel, he or she feels fit. Um, a lot of people will say the 14th Amendment applies to men and women. If you're born in this country, you have all the rights of citizenship. Uh, we know Susan Anthony was told in 1872 that it didn't apply to her. Uh, but also, uh, Justice Scalia, he has said he does not think the 14th Amendment w could be used in a sex discrimination case. Um, so if you can't use the 14th Amendment, um, and you don't have anything specifically that says that women are a part of this document, um, a judge can interpret any way they feel fit. So mm. I think that's it comes down to basic legal rights. There's a whole other host of issues that go with it, but... <laughs> uh, in today's vicious political climate, mm -hmm. what sort of progress do you see happening for the ERA? I mean, is this going to take years, decades, centuries? I hope not. <laughs> um, I mean, I see progress in the sense of uh, President Obama in his address um, talking about the, the Fair Pay uh, Act. Um, and it's progress. Uh, there's a Fair Pay Act and there's, a, um, there's another act. Uh, one act says you need to pay men and women the same. Um, today in the United States nationwide, women are paid 77 cents per dollar that a male would make. Uh, and this starts, a lot of people say, you know, oh, well, women, they, they get pregnant, they go on maternity leave, they take child leave, you know, leave to take care of their children. Uh, but, uh, you know, this starts a year after college. So when a, a, a female graduates from college and starts her first job, she's going to start to see uh, lesser pay per dollar than men. And these are statistics that are taken from the U.S. Census and from the Department of, of Labor. Um, so these are, not census, they, these are not statistics that come out of nowhere. Uh, so I think the, the Fair Pay Act is great because it says, you know, you've got to pay men and women the same. But an act is not uh, very strong, uh, not a very strong document. C corporations in particular can get around acts all the time and they can be repealed. So um, you also have, there's a, f a Fairness Equity Act, um, which says if you do have a discrepancy between your male and female employees, you need to explain it. You need to, to make it public uh, why you're doing that. Um, and that's meant to kind of tie in some of the loops. Uh, so I think it's interesting. There's progress in the fact that they are being talked about. Uh, there's progress in the fact that we have an International Women's Day. Um, there's progress in the fact that uh, during the Super Bowl this year, we saw a, a commercial, uh, Like a Girl. Did you, guys, did you guys see that commercial where they asked uh, different um, clients to throw like a girl or run like a girl and all the adults they went ah, ah, you know and they did the girly thing but they asked girls to throw like a girl and these girls you know they threw as hard as they could they ran as fast as they could and they said to these girls you know what does like a girl mean and they said you know it means run as fast as you can throw as fast as throw as hard as you can um, so I think 
girls today uh, have a very different sense of themselves. I hope girls today have a different sense of themselves. They're still playing uh, Disney Princess, um, but they're also playing soccer and softball and, and really getting into sports. And um, I, I think boys and girls today are taught to be more inclusive of their community. Um, they're very active. Uh, actually, this generation in school right now is more active than the students of the 1960s, uh, the, you know, the student activism movement, which I've studied quite well, uh, there's a lot of people saying today, no, these students, uh, they've been taught to do fundraisers since kindergarten. Um, they're involved, they're involved mainly on social media, uh, which doesn't sound like much, they're not protesting on the street, but uh, social media is knowledge. They're able to spread uh, a campaign, they're able to spread articles very quickly. So. I don't know if it's going to be a generational thing, I don't know if it's going to be a social thing, but I think Alice Paul would say, that's all great and everything, but get it legally and then everything else will follow. <laughs> uh, I have a, a, a practical question about yes. the ERA. Yes. Uh, I heard on the radio that the Mormon Church put tremendous money into opposing it, so that yes. no matter what we're talking about grassroots, mm -hmm. if you have organization, systematic organizational opposition, for all the reasons we all know, um, it's going to be very hard. Could you talk about the three states that didn't pass it mm -hmm. and where the main opposition now lies? Um, I think the opposition is from uh, conservative politics, but also traditional family-focused. Um, I'm not going to say religions, but I'm just going to say sex or movements. Uh, those three states that didn't pass, uh, Florida was one of them. Um, say Illinois. Indiana just passed there, so Illinois and Louisiana. Um, so you've got two big southern states in there uh, in a midwestern state. Um, and uh, there's no large faction, but unfortunately the people making decisions have a lot of money. And we know money talks, uh, so um, some of those biggest uh, organizations that would oppose something like the ERA, they have a lot of money to put into campaigning. Um, and they also get a lot of press, which is, uh, you know, they, they get a voice. Um, and whenever you see, like, a, a, uh, like, I've gone to a couple things, like, for Comcast to debate the ERA, they always bring in, like, me and, like, an opponent. Um, and that opponent also has a lot of money, so, um, you know, it's, it's, they get a lot of press. And, uh, you know, I think that their ideal is um, Focus on the family, um, which sounds great. I mean, we all focus on our families, but their message is focus on the family and don't be selfish. Don't ask for your own rights, um, uh, which is interesting because, um, you know, we celebrate in this country our movements for human rights and for, for individual rights, uh, but we don't celebrate it when women ask for it. Um, it's tend to be seen as like a selfish thing. Uh, it's also very heavily connected to the issue of abortion, which we know in this country is just divided the country. Um, so people have connected the ERA with abortion since uh, almost since day one. Not quite, um, but uh, that has uh, really divided, particularly re religious organizations, against the Equal Rights Amendment. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. My idea of equality. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, personally, would be decision making. Yes. I don't want to be equal to play football. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I you can choose be to. Able yes. To make decisions, and the people that are representing me uh, are usually men. Now, Article Three of the United States Constitution states that there, the Senate, there are two senators from each state. Mm -hmm. I would amend the Constitution to state that one of the senators of the two must be a woman. Mm, what yes. would Alice Paul think of that? Yeah. You know what? Um, I think she'd be happy, but uh, we have had countries that have done that. I think Denmark is Germany. one of them, Germany. Uh, and Germany just passed another resolution that 30% of your board has to be female now. Um, so we have had countries that have done that and done it successfully from so far from what I've heard. Um, I think Alice Paul would be delighted with that because she always said, you know, you need your representation to reflect your, your country. Uh, so women are one half the country, one half of the government should be female. Um, I think that uh, she, 
she would be happy with it, but she would hope that women would be elected naturally on their own, you know, like that, that would just happen naturally, um, which, you know, is not happening right now. So uh, women are about 22% um, of Congress right now, I think, numbers wise. Uh, so there's still a lot more to be gained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We're starting to hear a lot of objectives to sexuality defined as binary, mm -hmm. and uh, scientifically, and in terms of biology, and certainly socially, we're seeing more intersex people. Mm -hmm. So I'm concerned if we if we don't just refer to people, if yes. we refer only to men and women, mm -hmm. uh, that that creates a whole new category that's easy to discriminate against. Sure, colleges are certainly struggling with this issue. Absolutely, um, and I'm wondering how that. Uh, how that, how that dynamic will work. I'm just curious sure. about it. I know that Alice Paul herself, I mean, she wasn't, she, she there were intersex individuals growing up, but um, it wasn't considered a mainstream issue. Uh, today, not only are there intersexual, uh, intersex individuals, we have a whole host of different identities that we need to uh, be aware of. Um, when Alice Paul, I think her wording, she wrote the Equal Rights Amendment, and there's been a lot of attempts uh, for um, uh, congresspersons to rewrite it as the Women's Equality Amendment, uh, which she opposed in her lifetime. Uh, she said, no, this is an Equal Rights Amendment. It's going to work for, for men and women and everyone. Uh, so she wasn't necessarily addressing intersex uh, rights, but um, she did understand that uh, we need an equality amendment, and it could affect men and women at the same time, and it was simple, a statement that was going to help everyone in the United States, uh, every race, every class, um, every sex. Uh, so I, I, I don't think she had the notion that we have today, but she did have a sense of we need to focus on people and not sex uh, in our legislation. Mm -hmm. yeah, there, equal pay is only one of the issues in yes. corporate America. Another mm -hmm. one is promotion of mm -hmm. qualified people. Would the Equal Rights Amendment help people legally in that uh, arena, or are there other activities that are potentially helpful in that area? Mm -hmm. um, the Equal Rights Amendment, I think that you could you could file a discrimination case that you are not being promoted, because uh, we still do have that glass ceiling, you know, that, that term came out, uh, what, in the 80s, uh, that glass ceiling, and, and you can still see the numbers today uh, of all the Fortune 500 companies, uh, I think less than... 3% have female CEOs. So we know that women are still in the lower ranks in most companies, although we're starting to see more CEOs. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment, from what I understand, you should be able to file a suit uh, that you haven't been promoted in addition to uh, unequal pay. Mm -hmm. I'm just so happy that you came and told everybody about this woman who I have admired. She's the top of my list. And I didn't learn about her until I went into women's studies. Yes. And I would bet that if you asked here, you would find that very few people, even in New Jersey, where Alice Paul was from, you don't know about her at all. So I have two questions. One, why do you think she's so little known compared to, let's say, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton? Mm -hmm. And who do you see today as maybe our <laughs> Our cool. Yes, <laughs> good question, because uh, we actually um, do address the who's today's Alice Paul in our girls leadership program. So um, I think we don't know about her. I think history still tends to feature the old white men, right? Um, and what women are presented, they're usually in the, the text box history, you know, the sidebar uh, marginal history, literally marginal. Um, Alice Paul was also, she's part of a minor faction, faction of the women's suffrage movement. So you might see Carrie Chapman Cat in a history textbook, but you don't usually see Alice Paul. Um, because she's part of that minor group. She's also a rebel. Um, I think that although we celebrate that in our American history textbooks, we don't celebrate it with women necessarily, so she's kind of written out there. And there's also some record that uh, Kat and Paul did not like each other, and when Paul was going to give her documents to the Library of Congress, Kat told them, don't take those documents, don't share them with the public. So who gets remembered by history is sometimes comes down to whose documents are, are preserved and saved. Now, the, the Library of Congress did actually take the Paul papers, and most recently, in the 90s, they actually 
scanned them in and made them available on uh, online, so they're now available. But who gets remembered by history is sometimes written by uh, organizations. Uh, the Library of Congress is one of our biggest uh, national um, archives, so um, it, sometimes it comes down to that. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that she was uh, the rebel that she was, people saw her as lawless, uh, but she said, I never broke any laws, you know, technically. Um, so, uh, in my mind, you know, we should celebrate her as an American hero. She really did believe in the Constitution. She thought it was a great document. She thought that the idea that the founding fathers had come up with was great. She just thought it needed to be expanded to, to everyone. So. Well, I'm glad that we got everybody in on question and answer. And I wanted to... Uh, Thank Chris Myers for coming and speaking to us about Alice Paul. This is Thank great. you. Great job.